Hello and welcome everybody. I'm uh, Subhash Chandra and uh, welcome to our American Forget Society's uh, monthly webinar. Today we'll be talking about uh, Bat Barrett's esophagus, uh, kind of diagnostic aspect and surveillance options. Our first speaker is Dr. Prakash Gatta. Dr. Gatta has done uh, medical school from Mumbai and uh, his surgical residency from University of uh, Illinois. After that, he has done uh, minimal invasive forward surgery fellowship at Horton, Oregon, and now works in uh, Tacoma, Washington at uh, Multicare Medical Associates. And uh, he is uh, the forward guy in uh, Puget Sound. Um, <laughs> he does uh, in, uh, links and uh, tip surgeries for refractory guards and uh, have been selected as America's top surgeons by Consumers Research Council of America. He'll be talking today about biopsy protocol and use of warts in evaluating Barrett's for dysplasia. Dr. Gata. All right, thank you, Dr. Chandra, for the introduction that I don't deserve. I, be, I appreciate the opportunity to speak here. I think uh, for me, if, uh, looking at Barrett's disease, esophageal cancer and reflux uh, as, a, as a continuum or a spectrum, and looking at it or researching from a diagnostic side, I've learned, uh, I feel a lot, the, some of the things that we don't always see um, as surgeons. <clears throat> so uh, one of the things that I wanted to set as expectations is if you were a foregut surgeon or that's kind of your clinical interest, I would look at esophageal disease as a pyramid. So the very tippy top of the pyramid is what we wanna prevent, which is esophageal adenocarcinoma. And one of the things that over the last few years has been quite clear is that we have failed uh, in finding a way to reduce the incidence of this particular cancer with almost an 800% increase over the last 30 years. Um, and this is multifactorial, but I believe part of the failure is our inability uh, to come up with uh, standard screening or diagnostic tools. <clears throat> Clearly that there is uh, some correlation between the payer side, as well as the ability to understand uh, the disease as a whole. Um, so uh, it's one of the fastest growing cancers, certainly one of the fastest growing GI malignancies. Um, at the, at, and, and it's one of those potentially preventable uh, cancers that we, uh, as opposed to cervical and colon cancer, which the incidence has stayed flat, it's um, <clears throat> object cancer, not so, so, not so much of the case. In terms of treatment as well, it's a difficult cancer to treat, even if you were to diagnose this early. Um, and as you can see, the five-year survival rate has not been a significant increase over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. So a big issue is what we're trying to do is find better mechanisms, essentially fix the problem that uh, we believe is a problem, part of which is diagnosis. Um, so uh, in, in terms of, uh, in, in, if, you're a diagnos if you're a diagnostician, if, you're, if you do a lot of upper GI work and you're a gastroenterologist, uh, the average gastroenterologist sees 20% of who they see are reflux patients on a daily basis. And as we all would know, there's a lot of specialists who also treat this disease, ENT, dentists, uh, gastroenterologists, and pulmonologists. And along that uh, care continuum and that spectrum is um, um, a, a change in the, in the mucosal pattern of the lower esophagus, essentially, essentially something that arises after years and years of damage from this acid and non-acid reflux an irreversible ch change. Uh, we know, uh, and then we call this Barrett's disease, Barrett's metaplasia, as well as dysplasia. Um, and we also know there's a higher correlation or, or incidence of esophageal cancer with patients with this. Barrett's, uh, the presence of Barrett's, uh, the current way to diagnose it, at least endoscopically, is, is using NBI light, as well as uh, experience uh, uh, gastroenterology as a protocol to be able to find and create a biopsy-proven uh, area of dysplasia, which has a far higher correlation with esophageal cancer is essentially our challenge. So this is what Barrett's disease would look like. <clears throat> so uh, in terms of progression of, of the disease process, um, it, uh, the, the change is essentially a change from squamous um, epithelium, um, which is then suffered by GERD and affected by GERD, a transition to Barrett's esophagus. And within the Barrett's metaplasia, the crypts that are formed, because now these are columnar uh, uh, cells, the crypts that are formed uh, are, are usually likely the location for the dysplasia. And then there's two grades of dysplasia, low grade and high grade. 
high grade dysplasia currently can be treated as esophageal cancer. Between four to eighteen percent of patients will actually have occult adenocarcinoma at the end of uh, at the end of the esophageal resection. Um, and you know, part of the diagnosis is to do an endoscopic ultrasound uh, on patients that have higher suspicion for this disease process. Uh, <clears throat> So 20% uh, of the US population will develop GERD. 8% of that 20% will develop Barrett's esophagitis. And the progression, the pathway of progression of that cancer will, will, will continue. Patients with Barrett's esophagitis um, have a 50 times more incidence of esophageal adenocarcinoma. And this is why surveillance and screening of Barrett's esophagitis is essential. This is one of the reasons we believe is a, 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 the better screening is a better, more effective way of controlling this. Um, so of the US population of 300 million, 330 million, 66 million will, will develop GERD. So a huge denominator um, in, the, in the disease set that's out there. Um, so uh, it's, this is a busy slide, but uh, I don't know if you can actually see um, the current surveillance, the current acceptable or accepted surveillance mechanism is essentially to follow uh, the Seattle protocol. So you have to obtain uh, tissue to diagnose uh, the uh, lower esophagus and the, to establish the diagnosis of Barrett's esophagitis. And once those histological findings are found, uh, presence of Barrett's um, metaplasia, uh, whether the biopsies are indefinite for dysplasia, typically what we do is recommend a rebiopsy at three to six months after initial treatment. But if there is an established diagnosis of, uh, of Barrett's metaplasia and there's no evidence of dysplasia, typically we would survey these patients. Patients that are indefinite for dysplasia, sort of in between um, uh, dysplasia and metaplasia, we would confirm the findings with a second pathologist, someone that would con be considered an expert pathologist for esophageal disease, as well as for follow-up endoscopy down the road. And if there is evidence of uh, high grade dysplasia or, or esophageal endocarcinoma, of course, the patient will follow the pathway of the, the local uh, sort of the cancer protocol where you have uh, an esophageal surgeon see said, said patient. So, uh, so what is the Seattle protocol? Um, the Seattle protocol basically is, is the, the mechanism to obtain tissue biopsies using random four quadrant biopsies separated by two centimeters in the distal esophagus. Um, and in patients with an established diagnosis of, uh, uh, of uh, sus patients with suspected dysplasia or an established diagnosis of prior Barrett's metaplasia, it is recommended that there's a biopsy be performed every one centimeter. Now, what are the some of the flaws of the Seattle protocol is that in terms of the amount of tissue sampling that is obtained, uh, there's a huge uh, resource. This is a resource intensive mechanism where it's tissue consuming, it's time consuming to obtain those samples, have every of those samples uh, evaluate the pathology. Most importantly, are you getting enough tissue, uh, especially in the area where uh, dysplasia may start, essentially down deep down in crypts? And if you look at the, the, the sort of biopsies that you obtain, there are still areas that are uh, deeper to, from the superficial zone where uh, uh, tissue is not obtained. And more importantly, there's a lot of sort of user variance in terms of what Seattle protocol actually is, uh, depends, depending on training, local cultural practices, as well as differentiation between pathologists who typically will review a higher volume of lower esophageal biopsy. So there's a lot of variation uh, from, the, uh, from the perspective of screening. And the goal essentially is uh, to prevent or early diagnosis of esophageal cancer, there's been data that shows that the Seattle protocol does not necessarily uh, equate to a higher fiber survival rate. So this is essentially the goal of, of that diagnostic process. So uh, to summarize, the sampling error is it's associated with a higher rate of sampling error in terms of uh, intestinal metaplasia and dysplasia. Secondly, a uh, significant amount, this has been studied, a significant amount of inter-observer variability um, in terms of what the slides are actually representing. So 33% of esophageal adenocarcinomas, in this particular study, 33% of esophageal adenocarcinomas were diagnosed in this subset, uh, in this particular um, study, uh, on a patient that had a negative Seattle protocol uh, index biopsy a year prior to the procedure. Uh, there was no significant mortality reduction in five years in patients where uh, Seattle protocol was, was borrowed. So enter uh, uh, the, the Watts instrumentation. 
uh, I, I present this uh, as a way to essentially differentiate between the, the, the typical superficial um, biopsies as well as what a Watts instrument biopsy would look like. In terms of where the dysplasia is, these are the red cells that are deeper down in the crypts, uh, the tissue diagnosis that we actually want. Um, so those crypts uh, are much better accessed using a Watts instrument. Um, the, uh, the area of tissue sampling is larger um, and how Watts is different is the, the, the tissue obtained uh, is run through um, a, uh, um, a vision platform using artificial machine learning intelligence software that would allow for um, every biopsy is still reviewed by a pathologist. And I, I, was, uh, I had a chance to connect with a company to figure out how a pathologist can obtain a specimen from a patient in Washington state where I'm at um, how the pathologists work with this particular company is once the biopsies are obtained and these biopsies are run through their uh, machine learning algorithm, uh, what would happen subsequent to that is the biopsies that are concerning a red flag to an expert panel of uh, uh, esophageal pathologists. And these pathologists have national licenses in all states or how, as, as is governed currently, uh, the, where the specimen is going, which is typically New York State, the pathologist is, has licensure in that particular state, so it's usually covered. Um, but for pathology, it's not something I've had to think about before. If you send it out to another state, um, typically where the specimen is received in that particular state, the pathologist on that state can, can see that. But they have an expert panel who review every slide. Um, and the, uh, the, the difference between the technology is significant because um, uh, a combination of the Seattle protocol with the Watts biopsies appears to uh, correlate to a much higher rate of diagnosis of uh, Barrett's esophagitis. Um, again, this is a, a good way to sort of summarize what happens. It's, it's an interesting combination of an endoscopist performing the biopsy with this instrumentation, um, a, a machine learning algorithm that actually sorts through the histologic slides to look at which of these specimens actually are of concern. And then uh, another one with hu a human being trained uh, and specializing this particular disease set uh, that can review these particular slides. So this is a 3D rendering of what uh, the specimens would look like um, using the, the, this particular disease, uh, instrumentation. Let me see if I can get this to play. During an upper endoscopy, highly focal dysplastic cells are often hidden among mucosal areas of the esophagus, usually without any visible clues to show the clinician where they may be located. Watts 3D uses a specially designed biopsy instrument that covers a greater circumferential area of the esophagus, providing a wide area, full thickness mucosal tissue sample down to the muscularis mucosa, gathering cells, cell clusters, and intact tissue fragments in a unique disaggregated specimen that is up to 150 microns thick. To overcome the challenges of a tissue sample that's 50 times thicker than a traditional histology specimen, Watch 3D uses a proprietary 3D imaging system with extended depth of field to capture all the layers of a thick smear into 20 to 40 independent sections, all in precise focus. CDX patented technology merges the digitized slides into a single synthesized 3D image. This unique dimensional view of the specimen presents a much clearer image of cell nuclei and mucosal crypt structure, enhancing the pathologist's ability to examine cells in relationship to each other, ultimately leading to a more accurate diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus and dysplasia. Once the whole slide is scanned, artificial intelligence is employed to reliably identify dysplastic aggregates hidden among normal esophageal tissue. A neural network trained by expert pathologists uses an advanced algorithm to consistently analyze every pixel of the digitized specimen. First, the algorithm looks at a variety of lower-level features such as texture, color, shape, nuclear size, and nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. Then, it evaluates a combination of individual lower-level features, groups, and clusters, and compares these findings to a previously learned training data set. Finally, the computerized cell images are highlighted and ranked according to their degree of atypia. 
Areas identified by the AI system with the highest probability to be precancerous are then displayed via computer monitor to the pathologist, allowing them to quickly and accurately identify dysplastic cells that may otherwise have been hard to distinguish or even miss completely. Essentially, uh, it's a very interesting software and sort of employment of the uh, latest technology as long with human knowledge. And, and the result appears to be that, uh, number one, there appears to be a lot more inter-observer agreement amongst pathologists with the newer mechanism of tissue sampling. And it also appears to translate into a much higher detection of uh, the disease set that we're trying to not miss. So an up to 167% increase. Um, so uh, the yield is higher. Uh, there's, there's a lot less uh, disagreement among pathologists uh, about the diagnosis, and hopefully this would translate into um, a lower rate of these cancers, 33%, as we saw on that particular slide, um, a lower rate of missing these and earlier detection of the disease. So I appreciate the ability to present this uh, very interesting uh, subject for our webinar. Thank you, Dr. Gata. Um, we'll come to the questions um, at the end. Our next speaker is Dr. Houghton. Dr. Houghton is uh, from Los Angeles, California. She finished her medical school at Wayne Street, uh, followed by residency at the um, University of California, Irvine. She completed her minimal invasive surgery and advanced endoscopy fellowship at um, University of California, San Diego. Um, currently, she practices under Keck Medicine at um, USC. Uh, and uh, she is well known for her expertise in uh, robotic forward surgery and pioneered their uh, POEM program. Uh, she'll be discussing about cytosponge, biomarkers, and optical imaging in uh, Barrett's uh, surveillance. Hi, how are you guys? Um, thanks for having me. Um, and, you know, Pr Prakash's portion of the, of the talk really sets us up for then what else, what else can we do? And as we know, um, from what he said, Barrett's diagnosis is in diagnostics um, traditionally has been the use of endoscopy with the combination of pathology. So you want to see the um, salmon colored tongues of mucosa endoscopically, and then have that pathologist pathology confirmed with the goblet cells um, in the esophagus. And as we uh, communicate this with each other, and as we're diagnosing patients with Barrett's, we tend to use the PROG classification um, to document the circumferential margin and then um, the maximal extent. So uh, as far as standard, standardization of uh, Barrett's, we'll often see that you know, we can gauge from uh, endoscopy to endoscopy, whether this is progressing, regressing, um, and I think it's important for all of us to know kind of the standardization of how to report it on endoscopy. Um, we'll see the circumferential margin, um, maybe six centimeters from the G junction, like in this, uh, in this diagram. And then the maximal extent, there may be one little tongue that comes up a couple centimeters uh, more. So it'll report the C as the circumferential and then the maximum. Uh, this will help with just how we go about um, communicating to each other between GIs and surgeons about Barrett's disease. But as we know, and what was high, has been highlighted already is that there's limitations for not only once we see Barrett's, okay, yeah, you saw it, you wrote it, you class or um, kind of wrote down where, how extensive it is. Um, but then what do we do from there? What do we do with those patients? How, is, how are we gonna screen them? Um, we know that uh, the incidence of esophageal cancer is increasing um, and Barrett's is the precursor. And yet we don't have uh, protocols for the population-based recommendations for screening uh, patients. And EGD is expensive. Um, so that tends to lead questions of who to screen and when to screen. So we're all, there's a lot of um, companies out that are coming up with new ways or better ways to help A, know, screen the population at baseline. How do we do that? If, if patients are, can't get an endoscopy because that's too expensive to, to screen the entire population. And then um, with the patients with Barrett's, how do we 
A, predict who's going to go on to get esophageal cancer. How are we going to better diagnose um, dysplasia um, and metaplasia and kind of classify them with their Barrett's to know their true risk? Watts is a great adjunct to the Seattle protocol, um, but what else can we do? Well, the cytosponge is uh, a very interesting idea. Um, and it's actually, you know, one of those, uh, it's a population-based screening tool without endoscopy. Uh, the cytosponge is a small little capsule that can be swallowed by the patient, either in the, probably usually in a clinical setting um, it expands like a grow a sponge, um, like when you were little and you put the sponge in water and it grows inside the stomach and then it has, it's connected to a little string that you can pull out and it scrapes the inside of the esophagus to give, um, cells for pathology. It's easy. It's non-invasive. It's affordable screening test. Um, basically how they then analyze the cells for this trefoil factor three, which is, um, uh, one of those factors that's seen in Barrett's. The sensitivity and, um, and, sens and specificity for this is, is good. So um, this is a, a video of how this cytosponge works and hopefully it will play. There we go. The cytosponge test is a simple solution for collecting cells from your esophagus, food pipe. Enjoy the British accent. This innovative solution uses a small capsule-shaped device the size of a multivitamin pill. A thin string is connected to a sponge inside the capsule. When you swallow it with water, the capsule dissolves and the sponge expands in your stomach. The string is then gently pulled to retract the sponge. As it's retracted, the sponge collects cells from the entire length of your esophagus. Cytosponge, a simple solution for collecting esophageal cells. So that's the overview. I think um, this would be great because most of the patients that we're screening or that we're seeing in endoscopy are the patients that have a GI doctor that complained to their PCP. And I think a lot of the population is missed because acid reflux is such a common problem. And there's so many, uh, there's so much ability to self-medicate that patients may have chronic acid reflux and don't even think that it's a disease that needs a clinician's uh, help to treat. They'll self-treat. Um, so this would be something that could be done in a PCP's office. I think it's a, an exciting innovation. I don't know how it feels necessarily. I haven't done it um, myself, but um, I think that would be a limiting factor as how uncomfortable it could or may or may not be. This is not commercially available in the United States yet, though. Um, they're doing, they've done um, testing in, in the UK, but it's not commercially available in the US. But this is one of those things that if we could get um, to the population may, may help with, with screening. So other imaging modalities, um, you know, now we're going to switch gears a little bit to the patients that we know have Barrett's and yet we're missing the patients that are going on to get esophageal cancer. So what, what do we have in our toolbox to help us kind of treat the patients that we know already have Barrett's besides the Seattle protocol, besides just biopsies. The one thing that uh, Prakash mentioned already was NBI. This is kind of part of your standard, um, standard endoscopy and screening for, uh, for Barrett's. It's done during an endoscopy. Most endoscopes have um, NBI available by the click of a button. So this really should be part of the standard um, protocol. Um, basically, it filters with the, within the endoscope to emit a certain wavelength of light to visualize the mucosal patterns and highlight the mucosal patterns a little bit better so that we can look for areas of, of um, metaplasia or evidence of dysplasia and help guide our biopsies a little bit to the better to the high um, yield areas. It's about 90% sen uh, sensitive and specific. It's easy, it's the click of the button. I think most uh, endoscopists are very comfortable with narrowband imaging and this is, I think, used routinely. Um, it can help pick up um, metaplasia versus high grade dysplasia. 
Intestinal metaplasia will look like fine capillary patterns with this ridged or villous pattern and high grade intestinal, high grade um, dysplasia and even intestinal neoplasms have increased capillaries with tortuosity uh, in a dilated or corkscrew pattern. So these are just some examples of how you can use MBI, MBI to pick up um, areas that are high risk. There's other imaging modalities out there. Like, so the next one I'm gonna talk about is cell visio. So cell visio um, is kind of like a probe. Uh, it goes through the scope. It's a through the scope probe that can visualize um, the mucosal uh, areas up to 150 microns deep, which is the area where you'd find Barrett's and like, you, like um, Prakash said, that's where those crypts are and that's where we can really see uh, dysplasia. So it can visualize those areas and give us a better, hist it almost gives us a histologic image without sending tissue to pathology. So we can see that endoscopically, that histologic pattern endoscopically. You do have to give IV, IV fluorescein or a, some kind of dye um, in order for this to work. Um, and it's highly sensitive and specific. Um, here's some pictures of kind of how that works. It's a through scope probe. Um, and then on the end endoscop endoscopic image, you focus the probe on the areas of the Barrett's where you wanna look. And in the bottom picture, you see that histologic pattern. You can see it, it enhances, um, allows us to almost be a pathologist during the endoscopy. Here's some examples of the images you could see um, and kind of the patterns that would alert you to um, pick up metaplasia or, or uh, high grade dysplasia. Um, the normal, A is normal. B, in that picture, uh, we see some intestinal metaplasia, um, enhanced nuclei, nuclei and some, some of that enhanced pattern of metaplasia and then Barrett's esophagus on the far, um, well, the right side of the screen. The other thing that's nice about this technology is that it can use, be used in the esophagus, it can be used in the stomach, and can, it's even been um, uh, used as, as a, in the bile ducts, like ERCP. So it's, it's very versatile as, at looking at this histologic picture, and it can even pick up H. pylori, for example, in the stomach. Um, you can see in these pictures, they're saying these little white bright dots is H. pylori and, you can, and it uh, correlates to the uh, pathologic staining at the top. Um, you can pick up not only that they're present, but then also how much of it is present um, in the load of H. pylori. This is a very interesting imaging modality um, and it does help us see that histologic pattern um, but you have to know what you're looking at. And I think that's been kind of the um, limitation to this, um, to this modality is that you have to have training. You need intense training to know, you can see those pictures and see the histology, but you almost have to understand like a pathologist what you're looking at. Um, it does survey high risk patients. So where I think this could be useful is in, um, clinicians that are specializing in Barrett's and treating those patients. Um, and need, we need screening to see if there's some high grade dysplasia or concerning areas. I think this could help. Um, it's, it can guide biopsies to more suspicious areas. So we can, if we learn those hist histologic patterns, it helps target very high risk patterns. And it can also help guide EMR. So if you're going to, if you find an area of high grade dysplasia that may be um, uh, indicate you could do EMR for, this can actually help not only find the margins of where you need to resect, but also determine the fe feasibility of EMR. I said at the beginning, it was only 150 microns. So if you see um, that the, the distortion going deeper than, than that area, then maybe this patient is not an EMR candidate at all and, and would have to um, go to a surgical intervention or, or um, have some other modality. 
So I think there's limitations, but I also think that this could be very helpful in the right hands, it takes some time and training, but I think um, when used right, this could, could definitely be a benefit. Nine point is another uh, one of these types of um, modalities that can help endoscopically visualize tissue. This is more like endoscopic ultrasound. Um, it's, it's quickly obtains cross-sectional area and longitudinal images and shows um, irregularities within the mucosa. Uh, it's it has a very interactive user face, so you can kind of scroll up and down on the screen. It's a touch screen. Um, and it can also mark targeted areas. And I have a video that kind of that shows what this looks like. Um, This doesn't have video, so I'll kind of or sound, so I'll kind of talk over it. But you have this joystick. Um, this is your navigational pad, as it says, um, and then a laser trigger, and that's used to burn or mark areas that look concerning. So you have some kind of indication on the mucosa of where that area is. Through the scope, you place this balloon that you then inflate in the esophagus. And then you have this imaging probe. You can see in the video, it's spinning and it's traveling up the esophagus and taking these cross-sectional images of the esophagus. And this is the, what it kind of plays out to. So now we see the cross-sectional images as we go along, spanning the whole area of Barrett's. And, you, and then there's an irregularity there in the mucosa that we can target and you can press the button to make these little burn marks and, and that can show you the border of where that irregularity is. I feel like this, um, you know, it's, so, so this modality um, in the studies that I looked at had some inter-observer uh, variability is high as far as what you're looking at and, and deciding what is irregular and what's not. There is an, again, training and skills required in interpretation. It's similar to EUS. So you have to have that skill in interpreting uh, what you're seeing, um, similar to that of ultrasound. It is expensive and the other drawback is it's not very versatile. So cell visio, you could use in the esophagus, you could use in the stomach, bile ducts. Um, this is a balloon, it's made it's really tailored to the esophagus. Um, and so that's been one of the criticisms of this, of, um, of this imaging modality is that it's, it's almost too niche. But I, it, for Barrett's, if we're talking about Barrett's, I actually think it, it's a really nice platform. Um, I think it's a little bit easier to use and pick up those, uh, those uh, abnormalities in the mucosa than seeing a histologic pattern uh, necessarily. Um, and then it, I, I really think it's useful, again, for EMR. You can, you can mark those areas, the borders of their irregularity. Um, so if you're gonna resect that area of Barrett's or that nodule, nodular uh, Barrett's, you can, you can resect that at that time. Um, Again, you could target biopsies and maybe pick up more high-grade dysplasia than you would if you're just doing random biopsies of the whole area of Barrett's as well. Um, the last modality I'm going to talk about um, is tissue, tissue cipher. So this is not an imaging modality. This is um, kind of trying to answer that question, okay, we've got a patient with Barrett's just maybe even some dysplasia or metaplasia. And we wanna know their, what is their risk of progression to esophageal cancer? Cause we know it's not most, if there's a slow um, progression and we know that not everyone progresses um, from Barrett's to esophageal cancer. And that risk seems to be different uh, from patient to patient. And so tissue cipher, as the picture kind of shows, it's, it's trying to be the crystal ball for us. It uses forcep biopsies, specimens. So the specimens that you're obtaining anyway for the Seattle protocol, um, and you can send them out to, this, um, to uh, the lab, the tissue cipher lab, 
um, and it can predict the risk of Barrett's progression to either dysplasia or um, esoph adenocarcinoma. It measures a combination of epithelial immune cells, stromal processes in, in the biopsy to produce this risk class. Um, and it gives you a high, medium, or low risk of progression. Um, and so that may help you uh, tailor your surveillance protocols to, okay, this patient may not need an endoscopy every year. Maybe they can go three years if they're on the very low risk um, group versus the high risk group. You may need want to resect that area um, of, um, of high, high risk tissue. Um, the sensitivity for this in, in the high risk group was pretty low, but the specificity was high. So they're, you know, they, they have a little bit of work to do, I think, as far as like getting their risk algorithm to be as accurate as it can be. Um, but these are some of the examples of the staining that they do. They do multiple staining. They use AI as well. It's not just, um, you know, they put it through a whole AI and uh, pathologist type of a screening protocol to come up with this risk. Uh, I think we all know that there is a challenge of determining uh, who's going to progress. We need, as clinicians, I think we need better ways to not only identify Barrett's and catch more patients earlier on with um, Barrett's esophagus, but then once we do, uh, I don't think our, our screening mechanisms are good enough. Screening every three years, we miss patients. Or even if we're very diligent and we're doing the Seattle protocol, we can. there's so many areas within that area. If we're just doing random biopsies, we're missing. So these all these imaging modalities are there to um, help us find those high-risk areas and be able to intervene um, earlier so that we don't have so many patients going on to esophageal cancer. Um, I, I think in combination, if we can, these model, I think the modalities that I've talked about, I think the, um, the send out lab is easy. Uh, that one is just, you're doing the Seattle protocol anyway, you can send this lab out to kind of get a risk score to understand who may be higher risk in your patients and you may screen them more often um, or intervene in a more aggressive way. I think the other two modalities, the nine point and cell visio, I think are gonna be are really good for those high risk patients like um, in the males in their fifties, that long chronic GERD that have long segment Barrett's um, to really do a good screening. I don't think that's gonna be part of your every clinician's day-to-day -day protocol because of the time constraints. Um, but I think for screening for high-risk patients, uh, those are coming really handy. And I think those should be included uh, in centers that are taking care of Barrett's patients, at least one of the two. Um, that's all I had for you. That's what's on the horizon. I think it'll really help us as clinicians combat both Barrett's and the progression to esophageal cancer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Houghton and uh, Dr. Gatta. Uh, that was wonderful. And uh, we are um, on time. So we have about 20 minutes to go through some questions and discussions about um, aspects in using these techniques in clinical practice. Um, I'll, I'll ask those questions first, which were posted on the Q&A section uh, from Dr. Adam Chmisko. Uh, his question is to Dr. Gatta. He says, um, what is the influence of PPIs on WARTS 3D results? Should PPI be stopped before Seattle protocol or WARTS? That's a great question. Um, so I was thinking about this. I don't, first of all, I thought I didn't know the answer, but then if you think about it, if you have a patient that comes in uh, underdiagnosed or presenting for the first time with reflux disease, you get an endoscopy and the patient has severe erosive esophagitis, like grade C or D, Los Angeles grade. Typically what you would do is treat those patients because you can't biopsy them right now or biopsy them in an effective way to rule out Barrett's esophagitis. So you typically put those patients on uh, you know, two to three months of PPIs and bring them back. 
Um, so I would expect that a lot of patients that who do get Seattle protocol uh, or watch biopsies are actually on chronic PPI therapy because these are symptomatic patients. Um, so, you know, I would, I would also submit that I believe all the studies and the effectiveness of both the protocol, Seattle versus three, Watts, are probably patients who have had chronic changes from being on PPIs chronically. Uh, I don't think it affects the, the efficacy or so the yield in a negative way. I think that's just the disease set. Do you, Dr. Howden, do you think any differently? No, I, I agree with you. I think most patients that we're biopsying uh, with Seattle and Watts are on chronic PPI therapy to treat their disease. So I think most, most of those patients and it shouldn't affect it. Yeah. And if, if at all it should help as we often get this indeterminate for dysplasia patients who are basically untreated um, reflux injury, which kind of models the results. Therefore, I think I agree as both the panelists said, continue them on PPIs or treat their reflux well before um, biopsying just to get a clearer picture. Um, perfect. Um, next question um, from Anonymous for uh, Dr. Houghton. Um, since cytosponge is not commercially available in the United States, have we considered ISOGARD or ISOCHEC, which is a silicone balloon that is commercially available in the United States and has more than 91% sensitivity and specificity? Mm -hmm. um, it's probably bad of me to admit this, but I, I don't know of that modality. Prakash, do you or Dr. Chandra, have you have any experience with it? Yeah, I'm sure I don't know as much as Dr. Chandra does, but I have seen, it, to me, ISOGARD appears to be um, um, what's the protocol used for stool screening, like, you know, the DNA or you look at blood. Uh, I think it's a similar mechanism. It seems to make a lot of sense, especially if the cost is lower, there's no sort of procedure cost and sensitivity is high. What do you think, Dr. Chandra? So um, I have some experience, including trying to swallow one and did it successfully. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, ESO check is the uh, is the sample collection part of it, and ESO guard is the the patented technology to detect dysplasia um, or uh, Barrett's uh, metaplasia. To be frank, it was a challenge, and uh, we were part of this lucid trial. And out of eight people whom we needed for volunteering to be part of the site, only three of them could swallow it. Mm. Um, so it has a thick catheter and that kind of catheter gets stuck to your tongue. And to be frank, that was, that was our experience. So the swallowing is, is the bigger, uh, bigger challenge. Now, um, those people who are not aware of ISOCHEC, it does have advantage of not scrapping your throat uh, because uh, you basically put the, um, the catheter with the balloon into the stomach, inflate it, pull five centimeter and deflate it. Hmm. So kind of it's invert inside, so you don't scrape the rest of the esophagus. So uh, all the problems of cytosponge, like getting gastric cardiomycosa, still persist with ESOCHEC, um, but does not scratch the throat. But the other thing I learned that when you scratch your G junction, you can still feel in the throat. So if somebody hmm. says dysphagia hmm. below the um, below the sternal notch means esophagus, that's not true. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, ESOCHEC is a is a is a is a has a good chance. Currently, um, it's available, and uh, I think primary care doctor's office is the best place. We are planning to have it probably with our manometry lab because those nurses have experience in you know, making patients swallow the Bravo capsule or the, or the manometry catheter. So that's uh, administering is it's a challenge, and you probably need a lab, and you don't get much uh, out as a GI practitioner, so primary care doctor through the manometry lab. Is the way to go, I guess. Um, okay, our next question by um, Dr. Fanis. Uh, what happens if biopsies versus warts produce conflicting results? Can I answer that? Um, so I was thinking that, uh, so the whole, the whole point of warts uh, is the yield is higher. So you're, you know, if, if for example, the same patient had Seattle protocol once and then warts the second time, uh, I would think with the yield of the watts as being higher, you would obviously gravitate towards um, the abnormal results on the watts. Um, it, so 
it, and, and so what I'm saying is a false negative rate is probably higher in the Seattle protocol. So if there is a disparity between the two biopsy techniques, I would obviously go with whichever one shows abnormality, even if it's Seattle protocol and the Watts was negative. So I would treat that as a, you know, I'd be more concerned about uh, the abnormal finding no matter what it was. Yeah. Right. I agree. Yeah. I, I, um, I've had that situation. We usually would do the um, Watts and oh. biopsy actually on the same patient. So we would do the Watts brush and then we would take some biopsies as well. And I, I found that if there was going to be um, bar even Barrett's found or dis any kind of dysplasia is more often seen on the Watts right. uh, than it was on the forcep biopsy. Dr. Shah, yeah, that's, that's, that's consistent with our overall Barrett's management. You always make a decision based on the worst possible or worst histology detected. So if patient has high grade dysplasia once and the next time has low grade, you treat them like high grade. So that's consistent with the with the overall approach in Barrett's esophagus. Uh, I have a couple of more questions, uh, and, and these questions are for both Dr. Gatta and Dr. Houghton. Um, about the warts, in your clinical practice, we, who is the patient you're using? Are you using for surveilling a long segment Barrett's esophagus, or screening for people who have irregular Z-line, or looking for recurrence of metaplasia in a person who has Barrett's eradicated? So, so, so the question is, is who is the target for Watts? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, uh, you know, since, since I do far less diagnosing of the disease, uh, having, having a surgical specialty, this is a question that thankfully I don't have to answer often. But I would say that um, I think the, when you think about inner observer variability, so I think the sort of irregular Z line as, as a um, trigger uh, to do more aggressive, you know, treatment or workup, I don't think is very reliable. I think the you know, long segment Barrett's obviously would be, uh, you know, the, the subset of patients that, as uh, Caitlin had described, the sort of 50 year old white male with um, long segment Barrett's long standing history of uh, reflux, smoking, high risk factors, et cetera, would be the primary target. Now, I think we here in a society like this, uh, if there are recommendations being made to Medicare, for example, as to who the screening should be done on first, you know, as we have for colonoscopy screening uh, in a familial history, that would be that ideal subset of patient where you, you would have Medicare or a payer or pay for screening. Um, I don't know what you think, Dr. Chandra, but if you are 45, you're getting a screening colonoscopy, I don't believe the cost of an upper endoscopy at the same time is significantly higher as opposed to two separate visits. So, uh, you know, I think from, from in terms of a cost perspective for screening, um, uh, I, would, I would select the subset of patients with a prior history, a chronic history reflux, um, all the risk factors, prior history of metaplasia, um, patients, for example, who've had prior to reflux uh, disease and are still showing symptoms or, or evidence of esophagitis or, or, or metaplasia or Barrett's. Agree. I, I also happen to believe that, uh, or agree with the findings that we only detect 50% of esophageal cancer if we go by long standing GERD and risk factors based strategy for screening for Barrett. So uh, it's one way to go about it, but uh, it's not. It's far from perfect. Yeah, I think Watts. Um, we do surveillance on some various patients, and um, I think it's. I don't necessarily do it at the in index uh, procedure. If I'm doing, let's say, I'm do doing a workup for GERD for uh, a hiatal hernia or something, and we're doing an endoscopy. If I see long segment Barrett's, or if I see a significant tongue of mucosa, I think Watts is a, is a good way to go. Um, and then I, I think anyone that's being surveyed for Barrett's esophagus, I think Watts is a good adjunct because it gets the deeper tissue um, and it also gets a wider ba cell base. So um, the forcep biopsies, I feel like there's, you can miss, you can miss things if, and the Watts gives you a better just sampling more of the tissue. Hey, so uh, I don't think it's good. I don't necessarily think for just an irregular Z-line necessarily though, because I think that uh, um, 
you know, that, that may give you okay. false negatives, I guess. So I'll, I'll talk this or false positives, sorry. All right, all right. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what, um, what scripts would like us to use them for, but uh, I agree, it's long segment Barrett's in whom you are trying to minimize the risk of progression to uh, dysplasia or uh, cancer is the right person. Uh, another question regarding how to use watch brush. Um, um, if you can share a couple of tips on, do you use the brush to go back and forth? Do you use the whole scope to go back and forth? What would you take care about if patient has a hiatal hernia, any any bad incidents which we should watch out for? I think Caitlin should answer that because having mm -hmm. done zero. Okay, yeah. Um, so I think that um, lots with a hiatal hernia, uh, well, or even like a dilated esophagus is a little more difficult. Sometimes the angulation of the valve um, can, can just, uh, make it a little more difficult to get the cells that you want and get the scraping of the, the brush against the mucosa the way you want it. Um, mm. I tend, so there's so many variability in this. I tend to um, use the brush and go back and forth because they don't like my scope, like going in and out of the mouth and scraping the whole length of the esophagus. So I tend to use the, the brush, but I know some of my, my partners like use the scope a little bit more. I like using the brush. I think you should be the one, the surgeon should be the one or the endoscopist uh, should be the one manipulating the brush instead of having your tech help you type of thing because you can have a better eye. Um, and I think we're a bit more careful. So um, those would be my tips. I think just watching the tip of it, I like using the brush because I think it's more controlled um, and having whoever is doing the procedure actually control the watts rather than having someone assist you with that. Yep, that, that, that makes sense because, you know, the animation always looks easy, but uh, when you do it, by the time you have finished your Seattle protocol, you already have everything bloody and um, visibility is not the best anymore. And uh, being careful is helpful. Well, um, those were the questions I had. Um, if you guys would like to share any more insight about um, uh, Selvisio, can we can we uh, mark the site from Selvisio? Is there a marker like you have in? Uh, um, the that I wasn't. I'm not too clear about that. I haven't used it much, um, so I don't know if you can mark the site. Um, I know that that is the feature of the nine point, which is nice. Yeah. Um, so I don't think there's a. From what I understand, I don't think there is like a within the probe itself something that will mark it for you, like okay. the nine point. I, I had a quick question for both of you, which was that which of the newer technologies actually paid for? Uh, is there are there billing codes? Is there are there writers to a standard endoscopy that uh, uh, you know? How does this or how does that happen? Does that happen? Sandra, do you know? Um, yeah, so um, what's 3D brush? So they bill the patient separately. So it's not the, you don't bill the patient or your facility does not bill the patient. It's the third party billing. And uh, it's a little bit, they keep it a little bit vague and uh, that their goal is to get paid as much as possible and then uh, ask the patient to pay and then let it go. So cover they have insurance. Uh, is it something that insurance covers? Insurance do cover. Insurance do cover. None of my patients got angry with me when I did <laughs> watch brush. So, so far, uh, so good. But if they do, uh, the, uh, the company does uh, bill separately. So the billing is done through the company, not by your facility. It's interesting because I, I would hope that uh, if it's a billing issue where patients can be told, if you want this newer technology, you have to pay more out of pocket and patients may opt out of the newer technologies such as Watts and hopefully we are not, hopefully that's not happening is essentially the reason I was asking. Yeah, so how I've been going about it is that I would inform the patient that this is what we are doing and you will be getting two different bills, one bill from our facility and then another bill for the Watts 3D brush and inform them why, why choosing Watts versus just what we were doing before. Yeah. Dr. Chandra, you know, I know in a busy practice, we endoscopists or anyone doing endoscopy, there's a lot of pressure to get a lot of people through um, and, and kind of keep it 
you know, keep it moving. And, and some of these newer modalities, like the imaging modalities, like cell visio and nine point, they take time. You have to slow down. You have to take your time. They, they are a little more intensive. How do you see that playing out um, in, in a busy endoscopist practice? And, and do you think it's feasible to ask people to do it? Well, that goes point back to your point about um, these things should be taken care of by centers of excellence. And in those places, um, I think we do have less of uh, meet the, uh, move the patient issue. On the other hand, um, if all the GI societies, at least they agree that we should be spending about one minute per centimeter of Barrett suffix examining it, um, commenting on the mucosal pattern, the vascular pattern, use of NPI or just high, high definition. Um, so it is uh, Barrett's surveillance is time consuming by all means, um, including the biopsies and it's a messy business. So it should be done by people who are ready to take time and uh, to the best patient needs. Mm -hmm. I think the patient, the, the procedural, the GI proceduralists who are doing EMR, I think those things are helpful to help gauge. I don't know what you're doing now. Are you using mostly endoscopy? I mean, ultrasound to help gauge those margins or is it just visual? We have been going by EMR being the best uh, staging uh, tool for uh, Barrett's dysplasia. So we go by imaging anything abnormal, be proactive in doing the EMR. Uh, we so far don't see a role for US, at least uh, amongst the gastroenterologists, is that um, if you find a, when we say it should be done by a person who feels comfortable doing EMR, because if you don't do EMR, you'll make a case to not needing an EMR. So um, it should be done by a person who is liberal in doing EMR. Any abnormal area should be EMR, and that's the best staging. US in the mucosal level has not been that helpful so yeah. far. Yeah. So are you using some one of these modalities to help you gauge the margins then? Or are you, it's on a it's basically just, visual? Just based on uh, high definition, maybe some NBI. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that brings us to 5 p.m. And uh, thank you so mm -hmm. much, uh, you guys, for um, doing this. Thanks, Dr. Chandra. Yeah. Good to see you, Caitlin. Yeah, good to thank, see you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, everybody. Bye.